Okay, so um, welcome to this uh, session. Uh, we'll start uh, quite uh, quickly uh, now for this uh, webinar. I would like to thank again very much uh, Professor Riyad Mahaidi for this uh, very nice uh, proposal to prepare a short webinar about a very hot topic and credit system is um, quite important. Uh, Thing to deal with in, in Europe, uh, it's a uh, hot topic now for in engineers to better understand how, how we, can we externally strengthen uh, structures and guarantee that there will be no debonding. So, um, well, Briad, it's up to you. Let's start when you want, and uh, I will just uh, shut down my uh, uh, my microphone. If you want to ask uh, questions, feel free to use the chat area or directly ask to the Riyadh at the end of the, the presentations. Thanks a lot and uh, enjoy your webinar. Thanks, Riyadh. Oh, thanks very much, uh, Manuel, uh, and thank you for inviting me to give this uh, presentation. Uh, good morning, everyone, if you are in Europe. Good afternoon if you are in the southern, if you are in our part of the world. Uh, my name is Riyad Al Mahayi. I'm a professor of structural engineering here at Swinburne University of Technology, and we are situated in Melbourne, Australia. So, my presentation is going to be a review of some anchored systems that have appeared either in the literature, in the domain of research or uh, in applications in real uh, structures. Anchored systems that are used to improve the efficiency of carbon fiber, glass fiber, any type of FRP system that's used in the strengthening of concrete structures. Um, so I'd like to start my slide with um, an a sort of simple introduction about the uh, okay about the strengthening of existing structures uh, it's number one uh, it, uh, let me say at the outset here that the popularity of using FRP in strengthening of structures has become widespread um, and I'm sure this is uh, evident by the number of publications that are happening around the world whether it is in the domain of research or in the domain of actual applications. Um, Fifteen years ago, uh, if, you, if we talked about FRP here in Australia, people of engineers were very um, um, unwelcoming to the use of this new technology. Uh, I'm pleased to report now that the situation here in Australia is FRP has become very popular. In fact, in any retrofitting situation, the FRP is the first option that's considered, and if it doesn't work, then they will go uh, and look at other options. So, if we are looking at the why this has become popular, the use of new technologies like FRP technology is relatively new. Um, for newly built structures, there are situations where uh, there are design and construction defects, and you want to remedy those defects. Uh, and also for newly built structures, there can be uh, changes in use. So, for example, for example, in the use of the building, while you are building it, the function of the building changes due to the requirement of the client. And so that is something that has resulted in the uh, um, uh, required uh, requirement that some some additional measures need to be taken into account to, uh, to uh, satisfy the new, of the, the new need of the, of the client. Um, so in existing structures, I mean, things that happen in such structure deterioration, such as concrete spawning, reinforcement corrosion, excessive cracking, and so on, that requires uh, repair. Um, and, you know, FRP has become uh, popular in that area, or in increased loads, and particularly this is the case in bridges. As we know, the 
um, bridges were when they were designed 50 years ago, 25 years ago, 100 years ago, they were designed for different requirements, different load levels, different mass volumes. Uh, these are changing, and if we want to extend the service life of this structure to meet the challenges of the new loads, we need to uh, look into strengthening of the bridges. And as I said, FRP has become popular in this regard. Um, why do we use FRP? I mean, this is a general slide. They are lightweight, non-corrosive, very high tensile strength. They are available in various forms, sheets and strips, and the sheets can be wrapped conform to the geometry of your structure, uh, and uh, they have they, they, they have uh, this property of low uh, installation costs, lower installation costs because of the fact that they are very light weight. Um, the waiting for the next slide. Um, the problem with uh, just bear with me. I need to um, get accustomed to the speed of the clicking. Okay. FRP failures, when we use FRP in the strengthening of concrete structures, the most, uh, the most uh, relevant type of failure is failure by premature debonding of the FRP. And this can happen in three different modes for flexural numbers. As you can see in the photograph at the bottom right, and, at the, and at, as you see in the illust illustration uh, sketch on the bottom left. So you can have end concrete uh, cover separation fa failure, like pulling out of the concrete like that, pulling the concrete cover at the level of the main reinforcement, uh, and uh, interfacial delamination and interfacial delamination which is a failure that occurs at the surface of the concrete, at the surface of the epoxy and the concrete. And this is a very rare case. You can have what's known as intermediate flexural crack uh, debonding. And this is something like that, that's intermediate. And it's not, at, it's not at the end of the plate, it's somewhere in the middle. Our Bergendi moment is maximum. So you get intermediate flexural crack debonding, or you can get at the shear crack, intermediate shear crack debonding. And this debonding measure, this debonding uh, uh, failures occur at an early at early stages when the FRP stress or the FRP strain is very low uh, compared to the ultimate strain of the FRP. Um, in shear situations, as you can see in this uh, diagram, in this uh, in this picture here, uh, these are beams uh, and debonding mechanisms for shear strengthening numbers. Uh, shear strengthening numbers um, generally beams that are strengthened by side bonding, like you have seen these L-shaped laminates here in this example, and uh, they usually fail due to FRP end debonding. So this is the end of the FRP here, and that can fail in end debonding here. At the bottom here, because in this situation, this is kind of an L strips, so there is an anchorage. So when you are having this L-shaped uh, uh, diagram or L-shaped strip, um, you are going to have some sort of uh, good anchorage at the bottom here, but not necessarily at the top. So generally, if that if that is the case, what we do, we try to embed this into the flange, and this is one of the type one type of anchorage systems. Uh, it also initiates at, in places where there is a diagonal tension crack in the member, like here, okay? and then it spreads to the top or spreads to the bottom. So the debonding then usually propagates to the nearer end of the plate. I mean that's typically the end. The free end of the plate, which is uh, what happens in here, if it is if the plate is not embedded in the flash. Um, 
Okay. So a RP anchored systems, whether it is for flexure, whether it's for shear, or whether it is for torsion, uh, torsional phenomenon is comparable to shear phenomenon. Um, so we can we have looked in the literature and we have done our own tests and the theoretical studies to show that FRP and anchorage uh, has been proven to prevent other occurrence of end debond and thus increasing the efficiency of the FRP system. Uh, this, is, this happens because of the fact that the end anchorage resists the helix stresses between the adhesive and the concrete by the transfer of the interfacial shear stress over a larger area of concrete. Well, up until now, we do not have a codified approach to, to, to in, this, in, in regards to anchorage system. Um, according to ACI 440, the anchorages may only be implemented in practical applications, provided that design is backed up by sufficient experimental testing. That's a statement in ACI 440. So you, as, an, as a design engineer, I mean, design engineers should then um, look into the literature. Or in some situations, they may need to work with research institutions, universities, to develop efficient anchor systems, particularly if the project is a big project. Or they can uh, look into in the literature and see what's available in the literature in terms of the proven uh, anchored systems, whether they were proven experimentally, sorry, whether they were proven experimentally for the purpose of actual site applications or for research purposes. So the reason why the uh, standards now require this, uh, that you do testing, because of the fact that there is a lack of published experimental data. I mean, there is some experimental data, but not enough. Uh, and there's case dependency of the published results. The, those results uh, or these situations or these scenarios of anchor systems um, were used or are used for specific purposes. And then we have no, ex and we do not have design guidelines and theoretic models. That's the main reason why we need to do further testing in order to justify the use of anchorage systems. Um, okay. Having said that, I should mention here that ACI 440 now has a subgroup, a subgroup that's looking into producing a report on anchorage systems and how to quantify the effectiveness of anchorage systems. It is at the beginning, the work is at the beginning which is going to be based on existing literature, existing experimental results, and theoretical results. In Australia, we have got the Australian Bridge Design Code. It's going to, uh, the code is going to appear soon, and it has got a provision for anchorage systems. So the sum a summary of available anchorage systems, um, we have got u jack anchors, mechanically fast and mechanical anchors, and what's known as spike anchors. For members that are to strengthen in shear, uh, you have got mechanically strengthened metallic anchors installed at the underside of the beam flange, at the, of the beam flange to anchor up RPU wrap legs. Or you can have embedment of the FRPU jacket legs into the beam flanges so pre-cut loops using adhesive bonding and FRP anchors installed to restrain the legs of the FRP jackets, mechanical substrate strengthening over anchor zones of FRP shear reinforcement and FRP and enveloping the web of the beam and anchored at the underside of the beam flanges. I'm going to show some pictures, some illustrations of these different types of uh, let's, let's look at this uh, mechanically fastened steel plates for flexure. So you have got the FRP laminates here in flexure. These are the black ones. Okay. 
So to prevent end debonding and span debonding here, you have got a galvanized steel plate that is bolted into the concrete, that is anchored into the concrete. Very important here that we do not allow the bolts to go, to go through the carbon fiber laminate itself, but that can cause fracture, uh, a premature fracture of the laminate, okay, or splitting of the laminate. And this is an illustration of what this looks like. This is your carbon fiber laminate, this is your concrete, and this is the uh, the plate that is uh, squeezing down on the concrete laminate, on the FRP laminate through these uh, steel bolts. Um, there is the FRP anchorage systems using U-straps, and the U-straps here are usually, are usually uh, made of uh, cloth, carbon fiber sheets, okay? And they are at a 45 degree angle, and they are restraining and debond of the uh, carbon fiber laminates here at the end of the beam. And this was tried back in 2006, and we did find them to be uh, 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 to have a certain level of effectiveness. In fact, this was also tried with pre-stressing the FRP by a simple measure, and that is by squeezing a perspex wedge at the bottom here. By squeezing it in, you are, in, you are uh, inducing pre-tension in the carbon fiber strip. Um, the next slide shows the FRP anchorage systems, FRP anchorage systems, okay, and these are anchors, okay, but uh, what you have here is like uh, nails, nailing down the, cap, the end plate, the plates, plates at the end of the plates that are pressing down on the carbon fiber. The other one is concrete embedment anchor. What you do here is that, so this is uh, uh, an FRP in flexure that's embedded at the end here of the slab, embedded into the concrete beam. And the embedment here has got a certain embedment depth, embedment depth into the concrete beam, and you have got uh, epoxy that is going to cover the slotted group here. Um, the other one that was developed, and there is a list of references at the end of the presentation that is referring to all of these types of anchorage system, what is known as the spike anchors. And the spike anchors here are usually used when you are trying to anchor uh, CFRP carbon fiber reinforced polymers in the form of fabric, in the form of sheets. Okay, so what you do here is that you get a, a rope type of carbon fiber, uh, a rope type of carbon fiber uh, system, and what you do is that you embed it inside, you build like a dowel inside the concrete here, and you fill it with epoxy, and the top part of it, you splay it, you open it, you splay it into and mesh it with the carbon fiber sheet at the top, and you glue it all together. This is known as a bow tie anchor. Um, a summary of the anchorage performance for flexure, we carried out a comprehensive, uh, a comprehensive uh, search for um, the various types of anchorage systems that have been used in the literature, including our own, and we came up with an effectiveness factor. Uh, what this effectiveness factor is depends on the maximum strain developed in the laminates before delamination, or the sheets before delamination, and related to the concrete compressive strain, the number of layers, the modulus of elasticity of the carbon fiber, and the thickness of the fiber. 
So what we have, these are relative, these are relative effectiveness, effectiveness factors. Just to give you an idea, of the relative value between these four systems. So for a mechanically fastened metallic, mechanic, uh, metallic anchor, anchorages, the effectiveness factor was 1.87, inclined new jacket anchorages 1.36, the FRP spike anchors 1.14, the U jacket anchorages which is the third uh, U-jacket, this is 90 degrees, not inclined at, at 45, this 90 degree anchorage is 0.78. Just gives you an idea of the relative value between these various anchorages system. Um, as for shear, what we have talked about was flexure, what we would like to talk about shear now, and what you are putting here is that your FRP is on the side in the direction of the shear stress or the shear force in the vertical direction here. Okay, so the anchorage here can be in the form of metallic anchorages, angle sections that are nailed uh, or bolted into the concrete, either in the form of uh, a web steel or an angle steel, flat plate or like an angle. Um, the other one is uh, the use of uh, dis discontinuous steel anchorages. So you have got this steel plate here at the end, similar to what we do in the lecture. Okay, and we bought that like this. So these are individual plates. And this is this is useful when you have the spacing between the FRP uh, U-Raps is big, large, relatively large. Now, let me talk about uh, patch anchors that we have developed here in Australia for the purpose of using it for a specific project, which is the strengthening of the Westgate Bridge. We came up with a system that uses bidirectional fabric to mitigate the delamination of carbon fiber laminates that are used for shear and torsion. The advantages of the bidirectional FRP is the fact that they are simple to apply, they are simple in concept, simple, easy to apply, and there is no drilling required, fastening, or anything like that. You just, like a tape, you, 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 you stick on the surface of the concrete. And if it, it's a, if there is an increase in the anchorage strength that we get from this, and materially very, very efficient. So just to give you an idea here, let's have this, let's say this is your concrete block. The red here is, of course, your epoxy. And this is the laminate. This is the carbon fiber laminate that we want to restrain, that we want to anchor. And this is a bidirectional plus minus 45 degree carbon fiber sheet. So the carbon fiber sheet has got fibers in this direction and in that direction, plus minus 45. So the principle is very simple. When you are pulling, when there is tension on the carbon fiber laminate, these stresses are going to transfer through the bidirectional effect of the bidirectional fabric to the adjacent concrete. Effectively, what you are doing is that you are increasing the bond area between the laminate and the concrete block. That's what effectively you are doing. Very simple concept. Um, the, this type of anchorage performance for shear, we found, and this is based on our study, we found that the embedment of the FRP U-jacket legs into the pin flanges gave us an effectiveness factor of very high effectiveness factor. Our patch anchors gave us a lower value, but still high, 3.5. Mechanical substrate strengthening, uh, 2.55 mechanically fastened, me, uh, mechanically fastened meta metals, metallic uh, um, plates is 1.76. Now, 
in this situation here for the bidirectional fabric, it was extensively used for the strengthening here in Australia of the Westgate Bridge in Melbourne, Australia, back in 2009. Uh, the project finished in 2010. So what we have is that we have uh, these laminates, and what we put is a uh, bidirectional fabric, bidirectional fabric to restrain the ends from delaminating. This technique became widespread in Australia. So we have got these, what's known as double T, uh, sorry, not double T, super T beam post tension, uh, pre tension bridges, bridge girders. And this is the carbon fiber lamp. And that's the vertical ones that are used to strengthen the girder and shear. And this is a strip of carbon fiber, bidirectional carbon fiber at the bottom and at the top to restrain uh, or to uh, mitigate the anchorage, to mitigate the end and debonding of the laminates. So this, is, this has become a standard practice here in Australia based on the original work that we have done for the Westgate bridge. By the way, the Westgate bridge strengthening is the largest project in the world in terms of the amount of RP that has been used in any one project. And the reason, of, the reason for that is that this bridge consists of 38 spans, 38 approach spans. Each span is about 68 meters in, in, uh, in, uh, in span. We have done a lot of experimental index deviations into the FRP patch anchors. So what we wanted to do, what we wanted to uh, prove here from this experimental work is how effective these are and how we can quantify their contribution. So at the initial experimental study that we did for the Westgate Bridge, um, so we wanted to distribute the laminate adhesive stresses to a greater width of concrete resulting in an increased anchorage strength. And that increase was about 129%. So basically what we are saying, you are more than doubling, you are more than doubling the effectiveness of the carbon fiber laminates. So what we wanted to investigate in this further study was if the effect of the patch anchor length the effect of the patch anchor width, which is laminate spacing, and to investigate the influence of laminate thickness and width. So we came up with uh, four types of anchorage systems, uh, depending on the width of the lam the width of the uh, bidirectional fabric, varying that from 420 to 320, and the length of it, 300, between 250 and 300 millimeters. And this is the type of testing that we have used in here. So this is a schematic illustration of this. So we have got, this is our testing machine here. This is the actuator head, and this is the concrete that's being restrained by a rigid frame here. This is your concrete, this is your FRP laminate. So in this situation here, there is no anchorage. This is just FRP laminate and concrete, so this is a control system. And this is the side of you. And we have tried these different types of anchorage systems. So before I go to that, let me show you here. So this is your uh, the control specimen in here. We put lots of strain gauges in the vertical direction here in order for us to in order for us to measure the strain levels and from the strain levels we can determine the bond stress distribution and from that we can get what's known as uh, bond slip models that are used for the purpose of numerical simulations of the bonding of the FRP laminates to the concrete. So this is a picture of the real thing and the test. Uh, you see here that we have got dots on this, like, you know, um, lots of dots. These are dots that are speckle patterns that are used to measure the level of strains in the FRP based on photogrammetry. 
digital image digital image correlation or uh, image correlation photogrammetry. And this is a very, very effective and useful technique for measuring the deformations and from the deformations you can get strains and full full uh, full field strain uh, profile. And we also use in addition to that, we also use strain gauges. We just wanted one to confirm the results of the other. We are more and more moving away from strain gauges into the use of image correlation for the parameter or digital image correlation. Um, so these are the, the, the uh, systems, the anchorage systems that's used. This is your concrete block, this is your carbon fiber laminate, and this is the patch. Of course, the, we know that the carbon fiber is black in color. But this is something we did. We painted it white and we put uh, speckle patterns on it for the purpose of digital image uh, correlation. And more photographs of this. And this is like we are looking at the, the length of the carbon fiber uh, by direction of fabric and the width as variables in here. And preparations, some photos showing the preparations. Of course, you always have to make sure that the surface of the concrete is rough. So you use either water jetting or sand blasting. You have to expose the aggregates. And <clears throat> so you put a layer of bidirectional fabric. <clears throat> On top of that layer, you put the uh, laminate adhesive. This is the red one. On top of that, you put your carbon fiber laminate that you want to anchor. And on top of that, you put another layer of bidirectional fabric. So the laminate here becomes sandwiched between two bidirectional carbon fiber layers. Um, this is what, show, what your digital image correlation is going to show you. Uh, the strain distribution. So these are like some some from the camera that we are using. These are the type of images that you get. But numerically, we get these values. You can take any section anywhere to get the um, to get the strain profile, the formation and strain profile on the FRP as well as on the concrete. These are the type of dotting that's used for the digital image, uh, digital image correlation. These are two a set of two cameras that's used. The data acquisition system you normally know, use is one hertz, one, 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 uh, one data point per second. The specular pattern depends on the run, has to be random and has got good contracts, contrast. And, uh, the rough irregular surfaces create shadows resulting in bias and noises. So you have, this is something that you have to be aware of. Um, and the special attention has to be paid uh, to the lighting. The strain accuracy is between 50 to 100 micro strains. This is uh, relatively low given the level of strains that we get in the in the laminates and in the adhesive in the laminate and also in the sheets and on the concrete, which can go in excess of 3,000, 4,000, 5,000 micro strains. So this level of accuracy is considered acceptable, that high level of strain values that develop in the system. Okay, so these are the type of failure. So if you have got a carbon fiber laminate, and the axial and the uh, single lab shear test situation, you get delamination, and the delamination is you get in this case, for example, uh, the majority of the surface is that you are pulling on concrete, and we know that, and there is a wedge failure at the top here, and some of the some of the failure debonding occurs at the uh, at the adhesive level. Most of the most of the 
failure actually occur, occurs in the concrete. When you use bidirectional fabric, so this is your laminate, this is your bidirectional fabric sheet. Okay? What you are seeing here is that the failure that occurs, so this whole system act as one unit. They act as one unit. So your bond fitted surface is this is this, this big, the entire width of the block itself. So the bond area is much higher, and therefore you get a much better efficiency in the value of the load that you can apply on this laminate. And there are, there are some tables here that will show you uh, uh, figures of these. We, in some situations, we did get a slippage of the carbon fiber laminate the, through the sandwich arrangement. So you have got these two sheets, one on top of each other, the bidirectional fabric, sandwiched between them is the carbon fiber laminate. So in some situations, uh, was observed for uh, when the width of the laminates was small. We didn't find that for 120 millimeter wide laminates. And this we found also depends on the way you apply the adhesive and also the type of adhesive. But now we have developed, I mean, we, have, we know what causes this and what we wanted is to prevent this slippage and to make the system work efficiently as a whole and to transfer the full bond stress, the full force to the concrete. So what we found was this in the situation for laminates of 120 millimeter wide, two millimeter thick, we have got the control specimens and we got, have got two specimens that are, um, that are uh, used with bidirectional fabric. And what we found was that we got a failure of nearly 100 kilo newton, 99.6 in the control, whereas in the anchor specimens with bidirectional fabric, we get 213, 236 uh, kilo newton. In terms of the maximum strain capacity, it increased from 0.25 percent uh, or 2535 micro strain to 0.49 percent and 0.53 percent. So the failure mode was a pull, which is a pull of the concrete cover. So you can see here the efficiency. I mean, you know, the capacity of the laminate increased more than more than double by using the so more than double. So you have got 137 percent increase. And the other one, when you have got 100 millimeter wide laminates with 1.4 millimeter thick, uh, sorry, 100 millimeter laminates and 1.4 millimeter thick laminates, okay, and you have got various levels of the anchorage systems that we use depending on the length and width of the anchorage systems, and we get these failure modes, uh, failure values. 82 Point six was the control specimen, and these are the values that we achieved for the anchored specimens. On average, there was a 77% increase in capacity. In stage three, we used 120 millimeter wide and 1.4 millimeter thick laminates, and we got 95%, almost double the capacity. So these are very, very useful results. By the way, we have to keep in mind is that whatever increase that you achieve, this according to ACI 440, you cannot utilize, you cannot, no matter what you do, you cannot, it doesn't allow you, the code doesn't allow you, oh, sorry, the guideline doesn't allow you to use more than 4,000 microstrain on 4%. This is for the purpose of shear efficiency. It's uh, something related to aggregate interlock. A loss of aggregate interlock if you allow this strain to exceed 0.4%. So that's the maximum that even if you achieve 8,000 micro strain, the maximum you are allowed to use is 0.4%, 4,000 micro strains. We did uh, extensive work on simulation of these and uh, using uh, using finite element simulation, nonlinear finite element simulation, 
in which we accounted for the concrete, we accounted for the laminates, we accounted for the adhesives, and we used interface layers in the modeling between the adhesives and the concrete and the adhesive on the carbon fiber. And the one-step models that were used in this were based on an initial study on the bond step that you get from the um, bond step that you get experimentally, bond step relationships. So that's why you see the simulation results are quite good compared to the experimental results when you compare the load versus the strain in the carbon fiber laminate. Uh, we did also some uh, parametric study to see what effect the concrete strength has on the, uh, what concrete strength it has on the effectiveness or the level of strain that you can develop in the, in the laminates. So the concrete, because of the failure, it normally occurs in the concrete, inside the failure of the concrete, so the, so the concrete quality, the concrete type, is going to have an effect, of course, on the maximum strain that you can develop or the efficiency of the carbon fiber laminates. And this is quite evident here. We varied this from 32 MPA, where the strain level or the strain efficiency is about 30.35%. Uh, when we go to about 60 something MPA, 60 MPA, 62 MPA, we can go up to 4,700 micro strain, uh, strain development in the Apapi. Um, we also proposed in, uh, in our paper that is mentioned at the end of this, of, this, of this presentation, we came up with a proposal for patch anchorage strength model. And this is based on some existing models, and but we have used those existing models and we we uh, we modified them to account for the anchorage system. We did extensive finite element analysis for beams, full scale beams that have been strengthened with this type of system, the carbon fiber laminates and the carbon, bidirectional carbon fiber uh, sheets. Okay. You see the type of uh, failure that can occur and how much strength you get. So just to give you an idea, uh, a control beam uh, has shown that the strength of it is this much. This is load versus deflection. This is the green line. And what we found is that when you strengthen this with laminates, but unanchored laminates, you get this level of strength, this blue line. And when you anchor it, when you anchor the laminates, the bidirectional fabric, you reach this level of capacity, this level of capacity. Not only do you get increase in strength, but also you get a good level of ductility in the beam. Um, another type of anchorage system is by enhancing the mechanical properties of the concrete substrate. And this is something that we have done with the Westgate Bridge. But we have done this in the Westgate Bridge for the purpose of anchoring the FRP laminate. So this is part of the box builder to anchor the FRP laminate through a steel bar that we cut a chase into the, into the concrete here, because by design we found that there is not enough joint reinforcement in the box girder, and we needed to develop this stress into the joint by cutting a hole and a groove in the, in the concrete surface here of the box girder. I'll show you a picture of that. And what we found when we tested this in the laboratory, just the mere fact, sorry, just the mere fact that you are cutting a chase here, we'll show you that in the, few, in the coming slides, improves the capacity of the laminate we, without using bidirectional fabric. Just cutting a chase here in the concrete, fill it with epoxy, and then you put the laminates on top here, increases the capacity of the laminate because you have improved the substrate here 
uh, with the chase and the uh, epoxy. Uh, the anchorage system that also we did further studies to look into all these type of anchorage systems and combinations of so the bidirectional fabric patch anchors, the uh, spike anchors, and combination of these, and also cutting chases or improving the substrate, which I will show some photographs of. Again, we use this uh, uh, single lab shear test similar to before. And uh, using image correlation for the parameter and second gauging. Okay, so what we looked at is that if we cut chases here, so we cut in the concrete panels, chases, the width of this 30 millimeters, and it has got a depth of a certain depth, and normally the depth of it should not exceed the concrete cover, but otherwise you have the reinforcement, you cut reinforcement. So if we fill this with epoxy, these chases, and we put on top of that the carbon fiber layer. The other situation is that we use spike anchors. Keep in mind that those spike anchors that were used in the past, they were used with, not with laminates, but with sheets. So we decided that we want to know what happens if we use them with laminates rather than sheets. We get still some benefit from the spike anchors. So these are the chases. So the chases were of two types, chases in the direction of the laminate, so the laminate will go on top here after you fill this with epoxy, or chases that will go perpendicular to the laminate. So the laminate will be in this direction, and these are the chases that get filled with epoxy. And also you have got the spike anchors in here. So we got different types of failures. We have got different types of failures with the chases and also with the uh, spike anchors and the chases, whether they are perpendicular to the direction to the laminate or in the direction of the laminate. And I'll show you some numerical results here. So control specimen, no anchorage system. The failure load will range between 55 to 62 kilonewton, and that's the maximum strain level measured by the strain gauges, strain level measured by the uh, image correlation for the parametry. So when we use longitudinal chase, so the chase or the channel is in the direction of the, of the laminate, we get more than double improvement, 137%. We went up to a range of values of between 0.52% to nearly 0.6% of strain in the apathy. When we use transverse chases, the chases perpendicular to the direction of the laminate, we get improvement of uh, average improvement of 72%, 72%, less efficient than the longitudinal chases. And when we use the spike anchors, we get an improvement of nearly 90%. This is the level of those that we achieved with the spike anchors. And if you look at this here, this is the level of strain that we go up 0.4%. So what we can deduce from that and conclude from that is that, yes, spike anchors can be used with laminates. You get this level of efficiency. Longitudinal chases give you higher efficiency, nearly uh, more than double, so 137% increase. So these are the types of anchorage systems that have been posed, and they have been investigated in the literature. 
And this is a list of updated references on what's available, the important references that are available in the literature that, uh, that report on the various types of tests that have occurred and the various types of anchored systems. It's extremely important that we move forward with the development of design guidelines for anchored systems, because without that, the use of the carbon fiber uh, laminates or carbon fiber sheets is going to be always, uh, always penalized by the fact that you get easily rebounding and therefore we do not use the system efficiently or economically. Simple anchored systems can more than double the efficiency of the FRP systems. And with that, I thank you for listening and I will be happy to answer any questions.